uh, it's a real pleasure to be here on behalf of the Arctic Research Commission and the chair, Fran Ulmer, who couldn't be with us today. I'm very appreciative to the Wilson Center for putting this program on, to the obvious leadership, but I especially like to give a shout to Mike for pulling this together in such a short amount of time and to leaving space for what I think is a very important topic, science and research. So thank you, Mike, uh, for that opportunity. I'm also very pleased uh, at the level of Russian, Russian participation in today's event. Uh, as many of you know, there are a lot of events around town, this town, that are Arctic related where there's discussion about Russia's interest and there are no Russian representatives. So I've been very pleased to see the high level of participation and the broad level of participation by Russians uh, in today's event. I think it's very important. Um, so we're, today we're going to talk two panels on science. The first panel is, is uh, government representatives talking about policy, procedure, strategy, uh, and how that's been implemented in the government. And the second panel will be practitioners, people who are actually doing research. And I've asked each of the panelists to give some examples about how the U.S. has engaged with Russia in these topics. As has been said, science is a soft power. Uh, and conducting research, scientific research, is a form of, of, of diplomacy, it really is. We've already heard this several times this morning. For example, during the Korean talk, many of the examples were how Korea has started its Arctic interest by expressly through advancing its Arctic research interests. Same goes for China, Japan, and many other countries. So I often think of science and research as the pointy end of the diplomatic spear because as Victor Hugo said, science has the first word on everything, but the last word on nothing. And I think that's a very good way for us to start. So um, with that, I'd like to first introduce uh, Kelly Faulkner, who's the director of Division of Polar Programs, actually now the office, <laughs> after that change, the office of uh, Polar Programs at the National Science Foundation. Kelly. Okay, all right, we're all teed up behind me. Um, so what I'd like to do today uh, is give you some examples of some higher level science questions that we've yet to answer. It's not as though, even though we've seen a lot of change in the Arctic and, and spent a, um, an effort observing the change that we really understand all of the elements of it. I know earlier today people have been talking about the nature of the changes. I'm not gonna go into great detail about the ones you're very familiar with, the changing sea ice cover, uh, the fact that land ice melt is contributing to sea level rise and so forth. I'm going to draw your attention to some things that might not be as obvious, I guess. Um, I want to echo thanks to the Wilson Center and all the supporters for this event. I'm very happy to know that we're continuing the momentum of keeping uh, in Washington the dialogue going on the importance of the Arctic and the changes there. So. I, I echo John in that. I also want to echo John in saying that um, the science community has long been an international one in the Arctic, going back, as Mike said earlier, to the 1800s when we did the first international polar year. Uh, it is a very integrated community. I think science and education exchanges with Russia continue to this day and are extremely important. In, maintaining the basis of civil society as we go through the ups and downs of, of other engagement. So um, if you, let's see, how do I do this here? Next, do I have to point it somewhere? There we go, okay. Um, I don't have to repeat to this audience that the research community's concerns about the Arctic are conditioned largely by the rapidity and scale of the environmental and social changes that are occurring there. But um, moreover, to understand the Arctic requires that it be, is studied as an uh, interconnected system that's intimately connected to the Earth as a system. And most any map of the Arctic illustrates immediately the importance of Russia for understanding the Arctic. So I'd like to just say a couple of things I want you to remember. Uh, the Arctic is an ocean surrounded by land, as you can see. Uh, here's a few other things to keep in mind. The Arctic Ocean comprises 4.3% of the global ocean area and 1.4% of the global ocean volume. However, it receives 10% of the world's river water. 
It has 25% of the world's ocean shelf area, and you can see on that map that much of it is adjacent to Russia and falls in their EEZ. So what I'd like to do examples-wise is start with that area that is green on this map, but is often snow-covered, and is a combination of taiga forest and tundra and, and much permafrost. So we know, we have learned over the last few decades, that that vast area surrounding the Arctic Ocean currently holds uh, a reservoir of accessible carbon that is equivalent to twice the burden that we currently have in our atmosphere. And we also know that this whole region's been subject to changes in snow cover, thawing permafrost, plant communities are both greening in some areas and browning in other areas, um, and there are large-scale fires on the increase. So the important unanswered question for the research community is what do all these changes spell for the fate of that carbon reservoir. So for quite a while, we've been sponsoring joint efforts with uh, the Russian science community in extensive permafrost monitoring and uh, looking at all elements of, of how that carbon will behave. This example, and behind me on the screen there, focuses on fire-related mobilization of carbon. And, and as you can see there, you can read the read the, uh, the words, it's a joint project. We are working in this particular location in Chersky, Russia, where there was a fire 75 years ago, and it provides us a basis of looking at recovery. Um, it also provides us a basis of conducting experiments, as you can see right there. All these changes also affect the hydrologic system. So, what is happening with river water flows into the Arctic and all of the materials that come with the river water into the Arctic Ocean? What controls the variability? And, and are those factors subject to change? They are. Uh, so you've got to remember, as I said, a disproportionate amount of river water enters into the Arctic Ocean, and the fate of that fresh water has downstream implications for global ocean circulation. So it's very important for us to keep a handle on that. So this slide is showing a group of U.S. and Russian um, undergraduate and graduates who are being trained so that the world has the capacity to track this problem well into the future. So, and we know at the National Science Foundation from our research on education that when young people are entrained into the STEM workforce in an experiential way, getting their hands wet and muddy, at an early stage of the career, we tend to keep them in the system. So this is a good example of, of doing that. This particular young woman got an unusually early start at the age of 13. We sponsored a project in the Chersky region um, which involved uh, sampling from, well, actually this is in the Lena River, excuse me, region, sampling river water. And she volunteered at the age of 13 to continue that sampling through the winter time. So went out and cut through the ice to get samples to, to send back to the group. Where you see her in the picture right now, um, much later, she is working on getting the skills she needs for a science career by uh, working in the laboratory of Max Holmes at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution and in, in analytical uh, domain. All right, so let's get back to the ocean. This diagram illustrates what we think is sort of the main circulation pattern of the Arctic Ocean. I like it because it kind of looks like the circulation pattern of the heart in the body. And having spent much of my career studying the Arctic Ocean, I really feel it is the heart. A lot of the main exchanges of heat, uh, oxygen and so forth occur because of the Arctic Ocean. So a very important unanswered question, what are the implications of the warming on the Arctic Ocean circulation? Uh, and therefore also downstream. And then what are the implications of the circulation changes for the warming? Changes that may ex amplify the warming and so forth. So to study this, we must understand what's happening over the vast Russian shelves. So this particular diagram shows uh, target locations of a joint Russian-US uh, program. Both NSF and NOAA sponsor this program. It's called NABOS for short. It's led by Igor Polyakov of uh, University of Alaska at Fairbanks and has been going on for quite some time. We have an, a Canadian equivalent we call CABOS in the Canadian basin, 
And interestingly enough, that's headed up by um, Andrei Prashatinsky of Russian origin, but he's at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. I think as you start to hear these names, you're hearing just how entwined we are. Um, Andre was trained as an oceanographer in Russia. Russian training in oceanography is top notch. And uh, we, we do enjoy that synergy of bringing together the excellent training from both sides. So for this particular NABOS project, we have actually employed Russian vessels in the cooperative effort to work in that very important broad shelf region. And I would say we're still very much in a mode of discovery when we're up there working in these shelf regions. We are learning things we never anticipated. Uh, so there is a very nice science paper that got published uh, just over a month ago now by uh, Igor Polyakov and many colleagues uh, that is a summary of the fact that this region is changing dramatically in terms of the warmer Atlantic water coming in and accelerating uh, melt of the ice. We've also learned that this is an area where we have a lot of methane emanating from the seafloor. And, and it seems like some of that methane may be able to make its way through to the atmosphere. Methane is a very powerful greenhouse gas. We also have methane emerging from, from the green areas I showed you on the map in the beginning. So these are other areas where we have very un, uh, uh, important unanswered questions that we're pushing out on. Okay, and this, this is a, a slide just to remind us that the Russia and the US do share a border, if you will, at Bering Strait. Um, we have a really decent handle on the flow through Bering Strait from a physical standpoint. Um, so we, the, the issues that we have when we study the strait is that we've had difficulty over the years in being able to work on the Russian side. I'm very much hoping that the agreement Evan will talk about shortly will help facilitate that. But the unanswered questions there are that uh, the nutrients that are feeding the region north of the strait that are very important to our Alaskan communities are coming from the Gulf of Anadir or the side of the strait that we can't regularly get to. And we really need to get to there to, in order to understand this system. We have a moratorium on fishing in north of the Bering Strait right now because it's under change. We don't understand how those ecosystems are changing and we need to work on that in order to, to get a handle on those questions. The nutrients are at the very base of understanding that. Um, <clears throat> So this is just looking to the future and noting that, uh, as um, our ambassador so nicely said earlier, we, we lined up a number of projects we were looking forward to put in the field as part of the Arctic Science Ministerial. And there is one, which we call Mosaic, which will freeze the uh, German ship Polarstern into the ice for uh, at least a year, and ideally a two-year period. And there has recently been very strong Russian commitment to participate in that program. That's essential to make it work. But the reason we're freezing that ship in is it gives us an excellent platform, especially with the ice conditions being variable and hard to predict in terms of safety of setting up camps on the ice itself, but a platform from which to understand all kinds of things like cloud formation and other elements that are driving our climate change in the Arctic. So uh, with that, I will close my remarks. Thank you very much, Kelly. That was an excellent, excellent overview of, of the equities and interests that uh, NSF has with Russia. I really appreciate that. Um, our next speaker is Evan Bloom, the Director of Oceans and Polar Affairs at the U.S. Department of State. Evan has been referred to already at this meeting several times as he was the co-chair of the task force with his Russian counterpart, Ambassador Barbine, in uh, helping us reach this international agreement on scientific cooperation. And Kelly, by the way, was the head of the U.S. delegation. So thank you for your efforts on that, Evan, and we'd be very interested in hearing about it. And also, I am reminding the panel, we are a little scrunched for time, and I'm certainly not going to keep uh, Admiral Zukunft waiting beyond 3.50, <laughs> or we'll all have hell to pay. So thank you. Very good. Well, thank you uh, very much, uh, John. And I want to begin, as others have, with thanking the Wilson Center for this uh, fantastic uh, program. Um, it's, it's really great to be here and to see many uh, familiar uh, faces here as well. So um, as you already realize, I am not a, a scientist. I am a lawyer and a diplomat, so I'm going to have a somewhat different focus to 
the remarks I'm, I'm going to make, but my uh, Bureau at the State Department, um, uh, which is, relates to oceans, environment, and science, tries to promote science, U.S. science, uh, in foreign places, and that very much um, fits in with the work we did related to this Arctic uh, Science Agreement that um, I am going to describe. <laughs> I don't think it's you. You, you got to point you back. Yeah. Okay. I think I'll just continue. Yeah. Okay. So, um, in any event, uh, we, um, if it comes up, let me know. I will. <laughs> I'll let you know. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, in any event, uh, so um, it was, is, this is rather imp uh, interesting and a rather exciting moment in Arctic science uh, diplomacy. Uh, my office also heads the work. Uh, related to the Arctic at the State Department and working on uh, hosting the chairmanship that just uh, ended uh, for the Arctic Council. And uh, one of the main um, developments uh, and that was recognized um, as part of the U.S. chairmanship was this uh, agreement that I'm going to describe. And I worked uh, very uh, closely um, with uh, Kelly as the head of our delegation, and John was also on our delegation, and we had great support at the White House from Mark Brzezinski and others, and uh, it uh, ultimately was, um, we thought, quite a success. But I'll talk about the agreement and also in the context of our uh, cooperation with uh, Russia. Now, this is uh, an agreement that was negotiated um, in a task force of the Arctic Council over three years and nine separate negotiating uh, se sessions. And basically the idea was uh, to try to help remove obstacles to scientists who want to do work uh, in the Arctic. So I will uh, talk about um, uh, the Russia aspect uh, at this point, point. So as has already been mentioned, um, uh, this was, uh, the task force was co-chaired uh, by my, uh, myself and the uh, colleague, uh, uh, Ambassador Barbin of, of Russia. It was a very positive relationship. The Russians in particular, it's the Russians and the U.S. who brought forward the idea of doing um, this, uh, this process. Um, for the U.S. part, um, as you will know, the strong interest among U.S. scientists and U.S. scientific agencies in doing research in the Arctic, uh, in Russia. Russia is a very large part of the territory, of the national territory that exists in, in the Arctic. Um, so it's hard to think about uh, pan-Arctic science without working uh, within Russia. But the Russians also expressed very strong interest uh, in large part, uh, my sense would be, and they could speak for themselves on this, because of the strong interest of Russian scientific institutions. They saw in this effort a way of bringing to the fore within their country the importance of the work they do and also providing uh, uh, su support for, for their efforts domestically. So certainly the agreement is designed to help with access to all of the eight countries uh, uh, in the Arctic, but will certainly help with uh, access in Russia. So more broadly, uh, those of us who work in Arctic affairs at the State Department fully appreciate that while we have no illusions about the bilateral, the difficulties in the bilateral relationship, the Arctic is a place where the atmosphere in working with Russia is usually cordial and quite productive. Thus, uh, I would say the Arctic, uh, the Arctic Council in particular has been a kind of safe haven for cooperation. And this scientific agreement is a product as well as a beneficiary of, of that. Part of the reason for that, as has been mentioned before, the Arctic Council does not cover military security issues. It focuses on environmental protection and sustainable development in particular. And so that's an area where the bilateral conflicts don't uh, tend to, to, to come in. Also, the council works on the basis of consensus. So you have to have uh, uh, the agreement of all countries uh, as you move forward with any particular proposal. Um, so, 
I'm going to look at my slides even though you can't. Uh, they're very nice. There's a blue background. Um, I use the logo of the uh, Arctic Council U.S. Chairmanship. It's very pretty. It has an Arctic fox. Um, so already uh, Kelly has referred to um, the uh, challenges uh, before us with respect to Arctic uh, sci science. Um, there are a lot of universities, science institutions, uh, and federal agencies that have a strong interest in, um, in Arctic science. And we hear from scientists and those agencies that there are barriers to the kind of work that they want to do in order to have the most productive results. And that is problems that they have at borders getting into places, the problem of getting visas in order to get uh, into countries, moving equipment from place to place, uh, making payments in local currencies under certain circumstances, um, how to figure out which agencies to contact in order to get various sort of permissions and permits. So that was the kind of the, the background of the challenges we were working on. But at the same time, we recognize, oh, I think all of the Arctic states recognize that in order to have success in Arctic science, you need collaboration, and particularly international collaboration in many cases. So um, at uh, Karuna in the Swe Swedish uh, ministerial several years ago, the ministers uh, provided a mandate uh, to work towards an arrangement on improved scientific research cooperation among the Arctic states. So it wasn't immediately an idea that we would have an agreement, but to start looking at the various issues and Kelly and others led discussions of a kind of scoping exercise of talking about research priorities within the various Arctic states, but it was quickly understood that what we weren't going to do as part of this uh, task force is set uh, international research uh, priorities. That wasn't going to be the focus. And instead, we wanted to look, uh, it was agreed that we would look at obstacles. First, possibly in terms of a memorandum of understanding that would be non-legally binding, and then ultimately decision was made um, that we would go uh, move towards what we would call in international legal terms a treaty instrument. So the negotiations were concluded uh, on July 8th uh, last year in Ottawa at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, oh, sorry, Global Affairs Canada. Um, it is an agreement among the eight Arctic states, which you know are Canada, Denmark, Finland, Iceland, Norway, Russia, Sweden, and the United States. Um, it was signed by the foreign ministers on May 11th, uh, just a few weeks ago, and including Secretary Tillerson, of course. It will enter into force 30 days uh, after various notifications are sent uh, among the parties. Denmark is the depository government and is uh, handling that. Um, it is the third legally binding agreement within, under the auspices of the Arctic Council, and the other agreements have already been mentioned. And the idea is to facilitate access by scientists of the Arctic states to identified Arctic areas. So it covers issues such as entry and exit of persons, equipment, and materials, as well as access to research infrastructure and facilities and research areas. Um, the coverage is related to certain identified territorial, coastal, atmospheric, and marine areas. So it's not the, necessarily the entire Arctic. There are certain areas that have been carved out and are described in the first annex to the agreement. So the focus is on research that goes in, but that does cover most of, of, of the Arctic. Um, it also covers cooperation in the Arctic Ocean beyond national jurisdiction. So it does go beyond the EZs up to the North Pole. Covers marine scientific research, which was something we in the US particularly wanted it uh, to cover. And it also includes airborne scientific data collection, which is something that our colleagues in NASA were very interested in as well. Um, it covers education, career development, training opportunities, there's a number of other uh, provisions, 
It also focuses on benefits for non-parties when they are working as partners with Arctic state scientists. And a number of the observer countries uh, to the Arctic Council were particularly concerned that this agreement not undermine uh, their uh, efforts to do uh, science in the Arctic, and they were active as observers in these discussions, and so we have provisions in the agreement that deal uh, just with that. Um, the agreement lists the points of contact or competent authorities, and the U.S. Arctic Research Commission is the competent authority for the United States um, uh, under this agreement. Um, last point I would make is the, uh, the provisions of the agreement are subject to the laws and policies of the parties. And what that means is that the facilitation, facilitation is a defined term under the agreement, does not have to take place if what is requested is uh, contrary to the particular policies of, the, uh, of a government. And that was necessary because, you, as you may appreciate, there was no way that we were going to change our visa laws, et cetera, in order to accommodate something uh, like this. But it gives at least the possibility that for these various types of um, needs, governmental actions and permits that, that have to be issued, that um, central governments working with various agencies will be able to help U.S. scientists get into Russia, Russians coming to conferences about the Arctic, wherever those conferences are in the U.S., et cetera. So I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Much. Thank you, Evan. And I'm sorry uh, that your slides did not project. Uh, as the former chair of the commission, one, George Newton, once said, nothing ever works the same in the Arctic. And I think it applies to D.C. today. So uh, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, and now uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Martin Jeffries, who is the Assistant Director of Polar Science in the Office of Science and Technology Policy in the Executive Office of the President. So Martin is our White House representative. He also has the longest title of the meeting in that he is also the Executive Director of the Interagency Arctic Research Policy Committee. Good luck. I've just used half your time, Martin, but please <laughs> proceed. <laughs> Thank you, John. I too have slides, which I doubt you're going uh, to see. Yeah, the, the so next I two slides will, are. No, I will fair. continue. This is not fair. It's truly not fair. <laughs> do, you want to, do you want to go again? <laughs> no. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'd like to begin by thanking Mike Sprager and John Farrell for the invitation to be on this panel. I am, at heart, a scientist and researcher. I've studied snow and ice in both polar regions. And I happen, more by accident than by design, to have become involved in U.S. Arctic policy and U.S. Arctic research policy. Now, let's see. Yeah, that worked. The United States is an Arctic nation by virtue of Alaska, the 49th state, the 49th of the 50 states. And it was purchased, as you've heard, from the Russian Empire in 1867. As an Arctic state, the United States has an Arctic region policy released on the 9th of January 2009. It refers to, and I quote, strengthen institutions for cooperation among the eight Arctic nations and, further quote, promoting international science collaboration. The importance to the United States of international collaboration in the Arctic is affirmed in the National Strategy for the Arctic Region, released in May 2013, in which strengthen international collaboration is the third of three lines of effort. U.S. Arctic research policy, described in the Arctic Research and Policy Act of 1984, requires, among many things, one, the U.S. Arctic Research Commission to recommend to the Interagency Committee the means for developing international scientific cooperation in the Arctic. And two, the Interagency Committee to coordinate and promote cooperative Arctic scientific research programs with other nations. That Interagency Committee is what we call the Interagency Arctic Research Policy Committee, IARPIC. Exemplifying the strong interest of the United States in promoting international scientific collaboration in the Arctic is a new addition to our toolkit, 
And you heard a little bit about this earlier from Mark Brzezinski. And that is Arctic Science Ministerials. In 2014, when the Department of State was developing its plans for the US chairmanship of the Arctic Council, somebody suggested an Arctic Science Ministerial. Well, subsequently, the Office of Science and Technology Policy, where I currently work, recognized the potential value of the concept. And in January 2016, um, really got down to work, rolled up its sleeves to begin organizing the first ever Arctic Science Ministerial which was held in Washington, D.C. on the White House campus on the 28th of September, 2016. The Arctic Science Ministerial was attended by the science ministers, or their equivalents or designees, from 23 governments, the European Union, and the United States. The joint statement, signed by all the heads of delegation, resolved and I quote, that all nations conducting research in this region must work together to enhance and deepen scientific knowledge and understanding of the Arctic. And it also recognized, I quote, the importance of traditional and local knowledge and the sharing of scientific and technological information. Speaking of traditional knowledge, the ministerial was also attended by Alaska Native leaders and representatives of the Arctic indigenous peoples. As Mark put it earlier, they were at the table. The latter, the Arctic indigenous peoples, were representatives of five of the six permanent participants of the Arctic Council. They were at the table and, like the heads of each national delegation who made a statement on behalf of their government, the indigenous leaders each made a statement on behalf of their people. The indigenous people's organizations at the ministerial were the Aleut International Association, the Arctic Athabascan Council, Gwich'in Council International, the Inuit Circumpolar Council, and the Sami Council. Sadly, RIPON, the Russian Association of Indigenous Peoples of the North, was absent. In addition to the presence of indigenous peoples at the ministerial on the 28th of September, and again, as you heard from Mark, the previous afternoon, the Office of Science and Technology Policy hosted a meeting of about 30 Alaska Native representatives and representatives of those five permanent participants' organizations. There were also about 30 senior US government officials from multiple department agencies departments and agencies in the room. This was a listening session. It was an opportunity for Arctic indigenous peoples to voice their concerns, to describe their science needs and priorities, and to provide advice on the role of indigenous knowledge and community-based observing in Arctic science to those senior government officials. Back to the main event on the 28th of September. What scientific collaborations did the participants in the Arctic Science Ministerial agree to? There were four themes for the ministerial. Arctic science challenges and their regional and global implications. Strengthening and integrating Arctic observations and data sharing. Applying expanded scientific understanding of the Arctic to build regional resilience and shape global responses, and Arctic science as a vehicle for STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, education, and citizen empowerment. Each of those themes has a number of deliverables, and you see those listed below. Deliverables can be thought of as topics that are ripe for accelerated scientific progress through enhanced international scientific collaboration. There's a total of 15 deliverables, and under each deliverables, there are many uh, projects and programs and initiatives that were, are contributed by the individual governments that participated in the ministerial. The immediate outcomes of the ministerial were the joint statement that I mentioned earlier and that was signed by all heads of government delegations 
There was a White House fact sheet that was published online, which you can still find online if you know how. And if you wish to know, I'll be happy to tell you later <laughs> offline. And supporting Arctic science, a summary of the White House Arctic Science Ministerial. That is this um, booklet, if you will, or volume, which is available in hard copy, as I have here. And it's also available online as a PDF. I encourage you to download this. It is easily available at the US Arctic Research Commission website produced by the Commission as a contribution to the Ministerial. It contains the joint statement, the White House fact sheet, the meeting agenda, and a list of all the individuals who participated. The fact sheet summarizes the specific commitments, that is, the projects, programs, and initiatives that individual governments made to the deliverables and themes to advance scientific knowledge and understanding of the Arctic through enhanced international collaboration. The document also includes very useful synopses of the Arctic science programs of the 24 governments and the European Union. Those synopses describe Arctic research policy and goals, Arctic research funders, major research Arctic initiatives, sorry, Arctic research initiatives, and some information about Arctic research infrastructure. And finally, earlier in my remarks, I said that the heads of delegation, each government delegation, they each made a statement on behalf of their government. This was a roughly three to five minute statement. And so there were 24 statements and a fifth uh, from the European Union. I mention this because I had, a, I had many hopes uh, for the science ministerial. And one of them was that one at least head of delegation would step forward and say, that they offer to host the next Arctic Science Ministerial. Well, I was getting a little nervous because we got to the 24th government um, delegation and no one had said anything about we offer to host the next ministerial. And the final head of delegation statement was from the European Union. And her final words were that the European Union is pleased to announce that it is considering hosting the next Arctic Science Ministerial. Well, this was music to my ears. And as you heard earlier from Mark and Mark Brzezinski and Mike Sprager, um, indeed there will be a second Arctic Science Ministerial co-hosted by the European Union with Germany and Finland in a place and at a time to be announced. I, I did promise to my European colleagues I would not steal their thunder by telling you where and when it will be held. But you can expect an announcement very soon. That concludes my comments. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Martin. Um, and next and last, we have uh, Mr. David Kennedy, the Senior Advisor for the Arctic Region from NOAA. Thank you very much, David. Thanks, John. Uh, I see we're out of time. So thank you very much. I really appreciate uh, <laughs> the opportunity to have spoken today. So I'm going to be, I'll, I'll be very quick, uh, uh, try and really um, pare this down so you've got a couple of minutes to ask questions. So NOAA's deeply involved in, in uh, all Arctic issues, have been for a long time, uh, and we have Russian colleagues in, in an awful lot of what we do. Uh, this first uh, slide uh, just uh, talks a little about uh, our mission, just so you get an idea of, of where we're coming from in NOAA and basically documenting change with time series uh, and looking at those consequences. Next, please. Um, I wanted also just to show you, these are the six goals uh, of the Arctic strategy. NOAA has an Arctic strategy and a plan. Uh, and again, uh, as you look through these, um, most every one of these, I can point to some sort of a collaboration that we have uh, with uh, Russia, as well as many, 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 many other uh, partners. The complexity of the issues in the Arctic, uh, the funding available for everybody to do their job. Uh, if you didn't have everybody that you could get at the table at the table, it would be a huge mistake. So, uh, and, and please note at the end, uh, the international and national partnerships is part of our goal. We just feel very, very strongly that uh, you have to do that. So, next slide, please. Uh, so collaborations, as I mentioned, uh, I could go on and on about those. Uh, John asked for a couple of three examples. The slide that you see there has, uh, uh, a, a screenshot from something called uh, 
Arctic Irma. It's a data management tool used in emergency response, spill response, multiple data layers, both historical and real time. And um, there is an Arctic version of it. This was uh, the base platform that was used in Deepwater Horizon. So uh, it's a well-proven uh, system. Recently, we had a delegation uh, go to Russia, so this is very recently, to talk with them about lessons learned from Deepwater Horizon. In those discussions, uh, Russia got a briefing on this particular system, really became very, very uh, enamored with it, and. Uh, have volunteered to begin to add their own data to complement what we have in terms of layers for the Arctic. Uh, you'll see if you look at the shot that there are actually some data already on here, in particular for walrus on the Russian side. Um, the idea here may be that uh, we can do a joint U.S.-Russian uh, spill response and use this as a platform for um, uh, that, that spill response drill. Uh, we're looking forward to trying to do that. Um, I have a number of other things here, observation. We do a number of things as observation. We've had a tremendous program you're gonna hear about in the next session that has been terminated. It gets to one of the challenges I'll talk about very briefly. We also have atmospheric monitoring stations currently with Russia in a variety of locations. Um, data sharing I won't go into in particular. Fisheries management, we have an interesting program, fisheries management, where we do a joint survey of marine mammals, where uh, Russia and the U.S. coordinate on the surveys when they're gonna take place. Uh, the U.S. does them up to the Russian board, the Russian folks take over, do the surveys from there, all that data is shared. Um, and we're uh, deeply involved in the um, uh, Arctic Council. We chair three of the subgroups uh, uh, that you see here on, on the uh, sheet. So I think I'll stop there, except to say that we do have challenges with Russia. We certainly have, uh, and the challenges in, in part are due to the sanctions. We have, um, we have some uh, bilats that have been put on hold for some time because of the sanctions. Obviously, um, you would expect something like that. And then budgets, and, and the budgets uh, are, we're all struggling to find funds to do things. And when you look at international uh, activities versus ones that you can do within your own country. The international are generally the ones that suffer. So possibly partnerships that we could have uh, were a little limited in, in what we actually can do. And I'll just stop there. Thank you very much, David. I greatly appreciate that. And uh, what I will do as moderator, exercise some prerogative, and the sins of the panelists who did exceed their time will not be visited upon the audience. But I will take one question. <laughs> if it's directed only to David Kennedy because he'd stayed within his time. So <laughs> if I have one question for Noah, David Kennedy would be happy to entertain it. <laughs> okay then, well seeing none, I wanna thank the panelists very much for your very informative presentations and I really appreciate how you connected with uh, our Russian engagements across the panel. Thank you so much and uh, you are excused. <laughs>